You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hello there, future friends. I'm Kena, the host of the Historical AF Podcast. Katie and Nathan wanted me to let you know that this show contains a plethora of colorful language. In other words, they cuss a lot, guys. Like a ton. I wasn't supposed to cuss. <laughs> Anywho, if cursing isn't your jam, then this may not be the podcast for you. But if you're down for some F-bombs and you dig comedy history podcasts, then you're going to love this episode and you should head on over to my show. Historical AF is a boozy and delightfully foul mouth comedy podcast. Cheers, bitches. Hi, this is Katie. And this is Nathan. And you're listening to Queen's Podcast, the show about badass women in history. Queen's podcast, y'all. Yes, I am so excited about this episode. You have no idea. Y'all ready for this? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, this is one y'all been asking for since the beginning. I've been excited to cover since the beginning. Me too. I've been waiting for this one. And now that we are approaching our fourth anniversary We let our Patreons vote for who they wanted to hear next, and our girl, Catherine the Great, won above and beyond. Yeah, and today, in honor of that, I am wearing a head muff, Um, you know, one of those, like, uh, Russian head muffs, and I look fabulous, if I do say so myself. You look fabulous fantastic it really (laughs) suits you i think you should just wear that to your next like zoom work call (laughs) just be like stop nathan do you have a dead cat on your head what's going on there are you on drugs uh oh my gosh so obviously like i said we're talking today about catherine the great The famous badass empress of Russia. Yeah, and obviously, obviously what we're drinking is the Moscow Mule. How could we not? Gotta drink the Moscow Mule. I was like, I could potentially do like a white Russian, but I mean. Oh, I'm so glad that we did the Moscow Mule. Everybody knows about, you know, Catherine the Great and the whole talking about how she fucked a horse or whatever. You know, Ugh. that bull- that bullshit lie that we all know is a fucking lie. But some people actually yes. may not. But uh, that's why we did the Moscow Mule. So what it is is two ounces of vodka, half an ounce of lime juice, and then six ounces of ginger beer. So it's really, I was thinking like Moscow Mules were a little bit harder to make. Like they had more ingredients. So whenever I read the ingredient list, I was like, that's it. <laughs> it's a real simple cocktail i myself am not a fan of ginger beer so i watered it down a little bit with some club soda and it's much more bearable for me <laughs> i love ginger beer i love the taste of it i love that shit like i could drink it on its own and it's like for those that don't know it's not like actually beer it's just like spicy it's like root beer. yeah yeah exactly so whatever <laughs> totally i'm enjoying it so let's dive in actually first Let's do some Patreon shout outs. Patreon. Boop, boop. So first, thank you and a big shout out to Molly, Megan, and Ava. Also to Noelle, Jamie, Lauren, and Hannah. Thank you so much for supporting our show, guys. But um, also thank you to everybody that tunes in, follows us on social media, joins in in the Facebook discussion group. You the shit. All right, so our girl Catherine, uh, she actually wasn't Catherine at birth. Mm-hmm. She was born uh, May 2nd, 1729 in Stettin, Prussia, and her given name was actually Sophia. So we kind of have to unpack a little a couple things here because like, what the yeah. fuck is Prussia? Like, <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I remember reading a whole lot about Prussia this entire time I was like, okay, wait. Where are we talking about? So just to like simplify it and boil it down to its easiest thing, Prussia is like more or less modern day Germany. So where our girl was born was a region called Stettin that is now modern day Poland. So the kingdom of Prussia was- So it's not all Germany. 
Yeah, it's not all Germany. It's like Poland and Germany hybrid area. So the Kingdom of Prussia was like yeah. this thing that was 1525 to 1918. It's so that's why it's obviously not around anymore. But it's yeah. that area of the world. So back to her birth, though she was called Sophie for like the first 15 years of her life, just like we like to do to simple simplify things, we're just going to call her Catherine throughout this entire story. Are you okay with that, Nathan? Yeah, I don't, the less names, the better. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> she was the first child born to Prince Christian August of, oh God, I'm going to, absolutely we're gonna up. absolutely butcher and a lot of these names so guys it's probably gonna us. happen <laughs> yeah so her dad was prince christian august of and halt zerbst i think that is perfect and halt zerbst we're just gonna call him christian august prince christian august and his young wife joanna or uh i've also heard it pronounced johanna um i just i feel like a dick saying it that way i'm just gonna say joanna <laughs> <laughs> oh guys guys this match between joanna and prince christian august is not good at all <laughs> they are not meant for each other is this this is for this is foreshadowing this is foreshadowing for, yes <laughs> this is a big part of foreshadowing here. They Joanna was like fucking miserable. And she's a princess. So you think, oh, she's gonna, you know, she's gonna marry a prince. Her life is gonna be all wonderful. No, it mm -mm. wasn't. She was miserable. Mm -mm. So when she finally No Disney gets, castles in this story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And so when she finally gets pregnant, she's like oh my gosh, I'm going to have a son. And when he's born, I'm going to have like something else to do with my life and something else to put my attention towards. So she's going to- Her ambitions. Like I'm going to put all my ambitions behind this son that I'm going to have. And I'm going to raise him. He's going to be super awesome. He's going to be a great ruler. He's going to be powerful. And you know, it's going to give me something else to focus on besides my shitty marriage uh i think a lot of yes. people can relate to that <laughs> <laughs> probably yeah having a child but, to uh escape your shitty marriage yeah it's it's every episode of maury um so <laughs> or dr phil or several other trashy tv shows mm -hmm. so whenever she had the child and it was actually a little girl joanna was fucking crushed also the childbirth was like 15 hours and almost killed her Ugh. and then so after all of that to be like and it's a girl she was just super bummed and like did not even pretend like she wasn't super bummed and so as a result Catherine's childhood wasn't the happiest which i think is really ironic because this joanna woman you're gonna see throughout this story that she is just so obsessed with status and ambition. And it ends up that in her, in history, the only reason that anybody knows her name is because she gave birth to this daughter that she hated so much. Yeah, right. Isn't that, isn't that ironic? The only reason we're ever talking about her is because of the daughter that she was a dick to. Yeah. And uh, speaking of being a dick to, Joanna would literally tell her own child that she was fucking ugly. Like, and say, yes. you're so annoying, you're so ugly, and then, like, constantly berate her with all of these, like, character flaws or I anything that, like, Catherine accidentally did wrong. She would, like, hold this huge guilt trip over her. So, <laughs> not a super fun way to grow up. <laughs> no, and we have a lot of, because Catherine did write some memoirs, so we have a lot of Catherine's own words to describe things in her life. And she says of this, she was like, I'm not sure if I actually was an ugly child, but I remember very well being told often that I was an ugly child. Oh and my God. Like, Why is her mom like this? Like, what the fuck? Well, let's discuss that. <laughs> yeah. Like, I think it's really important whenever we have somebody that's so obviously an antagonist in one of these stories that we don't just go, and she was a bitch and move on. So let's dig into, though I don't think the reasoning behind it gives Joanna an excuse for being such a dick, but let's at least, you know, what made her this way. Yeah. So let's talk about her parents and their marriage so that we can understand Catherine's upbringing a little better. So first, what we need to understand about Prussia at the time is there were a shitload of minor princes and minor dukes. So there's like 
lots and lots of titles, but not lots and lots of money. <laughs> you hear about nobility now, even having like being cash poor, but like having lots of properties that are mm-hmm. completely falling apart. That is a lot of the Prussian, the Prussian nobility at this time. Right. So Joanna was born to one of those super cash strapped dukes, but her godmother was a very wealthy duchess. And this is where I think she gets like her obsession with the royalty mm-hmm. and, the, and all of mm-hmm. that is from her godmother because her godmother is a duchess named Elizabeth and she took her in and Joanna was raised in style. Yes, she had all the prettiest dresses. She met, she rubbed elbows with all of the nobility. Like, she was raised to be, like, an impressive dignitary's wife or, like, you know, be a mover and shaker. Foreshadowing, that's not what happened. I know, there's lots of foreshadowing in this. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So when Joanna was 15, her parents betrothed her to a prince that she had likely never met. Um, but I mean, it's a fucking prince, honey. That's that money. It's a prince. Come on. <laughs> Status, and, question mark. And then enter Prince Christian Augustus, which if he entered the room, you would just hear. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> He's a dud, dude. <laughs> he is a dud. Like, I mean, he's not mean. He's not um, a bad guy necessarily. Mm. He's just fucking boring. And oh, she's 15 and he's 37. (laughs) Yeah, that might be a little bit of it. Uh, There might be a little age gap there that he's uh, old enough. He's old enough to be her father. I know it's kind of gross. And he was like this really military dude that never Mm. showed any interest in pretty much anything much less women i mean it was just literally he was just all about military and didn't ever pay any attention to anything else um didn't do parties didn't do anything didn't go dancing wasn't into court gossip and Joanna is obviously the exact opposite. She was raised by her fancy ass godmother and grown up in style. So they didn't have much in common is what we're getting at. <laughs> I do feel for her because it's not like she had a choice. It's not like she mm. got to meet him and then be like, mm, hard pass. It was just like, you're marrying this prince. And we said, so do it. it sucks. Can you imagine if you were 15 and your parents came to you being like, I have found you a spouse. And it's a 37 year old man or whatever. No. No. <laughs> Can I just get my learner's permit instead? <laughs> 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 ugh, ugh. He's old enough to be your father. Gross. After their wedding, mom and dad head back to Stetton, where uh, Joanna had never been before. So she didn't really know what to expect. It was 100% a military town. Basically, she was brought to an army base or mm. whatever, you know, like everyone the whole the industry of the town was military everyone that lived in the town was like her husband on top of her not really connecting with her husband it's not like there was any society that she could like dig into do you know what Mm -hmm. i mean yeah because i mean i when you talk about it i think about the army towns that we have like here in texas like there's like Mm -hmm. certain towns where there's like forts you know that are built and then it's it's an army town there's not much to do there's not much culture you just kind of sit at home while your husband's out doing his military shit yeah (laughs) like when my uh, because my dad was in the military when i was a baby and my mom you know moved around with him but she would make friends with the other military spouses that were staying home it doesn't seem like that was really an option for joanna it doesn't seem like there were any there were probably other military wives there but they're like her mother's age yeah they're not 15 (laughs) she doesn't have any friends and so she gets really depressed she joanna gets really lonely and her husband doesn't seem to notice so i could see you could internalize that a couple different ways and the way she internalized it was to become bitter which Mm. sucks but it's a natural reaction so now that you know why she's so miserable we can kind of maybe understand her actions a little bit better, even though I feel like it doesn't justify them. But it does tell you what you're working with 
with Catherine's yeah. upbringing, you know, her dad, while he was loving, he was never really around. So basically, um, her whole childhood is trying to avoid the wrath of her super bitch mother. I mean, that's, that's all she's just trying not to get totally. in trouble and yelled at. I mean, which is a natural right. reaction. And what I just, I just imagine like, that's going to have you s- so much stress at such a young age oh for sure it wasn't just her mother either even though they weren't they weren't a rich family they were still part of the nobility so they were expected to have to have their kids have really good education even their daughters she was hired like these renowned tutors to teach her but they would put her down too because not because she wasn't smart, just because she asked questions that they felt were inappropriate for a child to be asking. And it's like, as an educator, wouldn't you want an inquisitive student? Yeah, not one that's just like, yeah, yeah, not one that's just like, oh, okay, you know, mm-hmm. wouldn't you want to debate? I don't, for instance, let me give you a really good example of it. So this uh, Lutheran pastor named Pastor Wagner was brought in to teach her history, geography, and religious studies. And I think the fact that she's getting taught like history and geography, like we don't hear about geography necessarily a lot. So no, you yeah, really she's getting don't. a good education. The pastor teaches her, okay, as Lutherans, we believe that Jesus died for our sins so that we can go to heaven. And so like little baby Catherine is like, well, what about the people that were alive before Jesus? Where did they go when they died? And the Lutheran pastor is like, yeah, good question. And he's like, oh, they all they all went to hell. <laughs> yeah. She's like, Whoa. wait. Yeah. What? Why? Why? Why is it their fault that exactly. they were born before Jesus's existence? And, you know, I can relate to that because I think even as a child, I right? asked that same question, which was like, what happened to the people before Jesus? And it's like, uh, well, stop asking that. Here's Veggie Tales, but they didn't have Veggie Tales back then. <laughs> but Catherine very specifically cited, she was like, well, what about like Plato, Aristotle, like these great minds from antiquity, which I wouldn't have thought to ask whenever I was six. I wouldn't have been like, but what about Plato? You know, like, right, right. <laughs> she's like, you're telling me mm-hmm. they're going to hell just because they had the bad misfortune of not knowing about Jesus? Guess what? Old men don't like being questioned by children. And so she would get beaten. Especially yeah. young girls, she would get too. Beat. Her, her teacher would beat her with a cane for, like, asking questions. Because oh he didn't know God. how to answer because they are legitimately good questions. And so he would just beat the shit out of her. Like, it's like this little girl is growing up with not only a mother who's horrible to her, but a tutor that, like, literally beats her for just asking questions. Like, I am so grateful, though, that that didn't stop her from being inquisitive because a big thing of her life, like, her life motto is, like, always keep learning, always keep reading, always keep. And so I'm so glad he didn't literally beat <laughs> the uh, curiosity out of her yeah and well her life wasn't like a hundred percent all that bad she did have like a little light in her life and it was um her french governess her french governess named uh babette and she was babette was really oh, nice God. to her and uh spoiler alert this is kind of this kind of gives her her persuasion towards the french court yeah. and life and the enlightenment mm-hmm. era and mm-hmm. all of that so babette would go and seek out books that she thought that Catherine would like. And then she would tell her how clever and witty she was, that some people would be impressed with her asking these complicated questions. So, I mean, it's like somebody who's giving her refuge and being like, honey, you're not all that bad. I mean, asking that question is a normal question. I'm so happy that she had at least this one person in her life because her father was kind to her. He just wasn't around. Like, he didn't know. Besides religion and history, her education also included languages and etiquette because she's expected you know to be like become the wife of a dignitary and you don't know that where that's going to take you and she loved learning new languages i wish i loved learning new languages i'm i'm so bad <laughs> i know right i hate it like but she, she loved french she fucking parlez-vous francais 
We oui, oui. Yes. <laughs> I mean, is it any coincidence that the only person that was nice to her in the world was a French woman and she took to French like a fish takes to water? No, I don't think that's a coincidence. Yeah, and I could just imagine her and her French governess like talking to each other yeah. in French, you know, just to, and so that being kind of like their secret language I love it. together. I love it. <laughs> so it's pretty evident that she's a smart kid. I wonder if it was like, part of that was trying to overcompensate because her mom is always telling her her flaws. Her mom is never pointing out the good thing. So she's like, okay, I, I get that oh, I'm ugly. Sure. I can't control that. But maybe if I just do my best at my studies and everything else and have the perfect etiquette and everything else, maybe she'll find something to be proud of me about. Yeah, it's kind of sad that she's basically trying to win the approval of a parent who's never going to give her Yeah, you're always going to be a girl. (laughs) You're always going to be a disappointment. And I mean, it doesn't like she wasn't she wasn't even ugly, though. Like, that's the whole fucked up thing. I mean, not that it mattered. Even if she was ugly, her mother should be. Nice to her. Right? It doesn't matter. But I mean, still, like, you look at pictures of her whenever she was older, and she was not an ugly woman. You we know? talk like, about, like, Elizabeth Woodville, Agnes Sorrell, who were, like, the ideal beauty standard of their time. She mm-hmm. wasn't that. But who is? <laughs> you know, like. Yeah. She, but but yeah, she was right? still perfectly cute. She was a cute kid, and she was a cute teenager, and she was a pretty woman. Like. She was never at any point ugly. It's very sad. Pretty woman, gonna rule Russia. Pretty woman. I love it. (laughs) Came from Prussia. (laughs) New hit single, hitting the iTunes charts. Yes. But yeah, no, she had, she had like a nice complexion. She had light brown hair with bright, bright blue eyes. Perfectly cute. Nothing ugly, but. Yeah, and just and just like any royal family, the mom Joanna's like the only the only thing that you amount to to me is a marriage yeah. proposal, you know, a dowry or whatever, you know. And I think like Catherine was like, getting married is a means of GTFOing out of this fucking place. Like, hey, I want to get out of this hellhole, so maybe marrying somebody and moving out of the household isn't such a bad idea. So yeah, let's get me married up. Yeah, what, can I get married tomorrow? Yeah, let's get me out of here. And Catholic and Catherine's like <laughs> um, early years. I think at around like age eight, her mom started taking her all over Prussia. So Joanna's family is like a couple of rings above the dad's family. So I remember she grew Mm. up at a fancy court. So she knows all of the big mover and shakers in Prussian nobility. And she's like closely related to them. So it really wasn't super uncommon for her to get invited like to Easter at some Duke's house, or if she called on, some really rich duchess or princess or something for her to be invited over. So she would make the rounds in Berlin with Catherine as young as eight years old and just basically be like, this is my daughter who, who's got a son for her. I got to get her married. And Catherine, she'd be like, Catherine, do a trick. And Catherine would do a perfect curtsy. Hello, my baby. Hello, my darling. Hello, my time child. Who's got a husband for me? I'm ready to get out of my mom's house. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. I love it. <laughs> but like for real though, Catherine knew how to really make a good mm-hmm. impression mm-hmm. though. You know, she was really good at that. And I think there's a trait that can't always be taught. You know, that's not something that you can you can't teach someone charisma. Being likable isn't yeah. Some people are just naturally people are drawn to them. Mm-hmm. That's Catherine's personality, which good for her. Yeah. And I thinking about it, it's like maybe it's because she spent her entire life trying to gain her mother's mm-hmm. approval. So maybe, you know, being very good at impressing I'm people. I'm not a psychologist, but I bet that has something to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> so she's also like really observant. She listened to grownups talk a lot and she picked up on really quick you know, the, that whole concept of the family tree and nobility, which is very important. To know who's 
how closely is this person related to this other person? And, oh, they, they've they mentioned that they're very proud of their son. So when I meet that son, I'm going to bring up, oh, I met your mother, I met your father or something like that. She was really good at remembering like the who's who, which will come in very mm-hmm. handy for her later in her life. And she also learned people like talking about themselves more than they like listening to other people. That is still true today. It's part of human nature, but she was more than happy Mm -hmm. to just listen and take it all in. And so she was really popular from a young age anywhere she went. So super popular baby Catherine in 1739 meets someone who might be important later in this story. Maybe. Um, <laughs> Joanna's brother became the legal guardian of this orphan, um, a little baby Duke named Peter. And it was thought that baby Duke Peter would one day be the king of Sweden. Mm-hmm. So Catherine's 10, Peter's 11, you know, making sense here. Gotta marry her up. Catherine knows she's being introduced to him because he's probably going to be the king of Sweden and she has to marry someone with an impressive title. And a king... It's a pretty impressive title. (laughs) (laughs) Baby Duke Peter and Catherine get along well enough, though she wrote in her diary after meeting him that, like, they're cousins, because of course they are, because as we've discussed, you have to have sex with cousins to be royalty. And she wrote in her diary... Cousin Peter is nice enough, but he drinks too much. He's 11. (laughs) He's 11 years old. He's 11 and he's an alcoholic already. Red flag, red flag, red flag. (laughs) But even at age 10, she knows the whole reason that she's being introduced to Peter is because her mom is trying to move around the pieces and get her married to the future king of Sweden. And she's like, okay, I guess I'm going to marry this alcoholic child. Cool. <laughs> so fast forward about fast forward about three or four years, and that little orphan duke that was meant to be the future king of Sweden has now been swept away to Russia. Hence the hat that I have on right now. Yes. <laughs> um, it turns it turns out that he is the last living male descendant of Peter the Great of Russia, and uh, Peter the Great was Peter the Great for a reason. Yeah. Peter the Great was little baby orphan duke's grandfather. Yes. It's kind of a crazy story. Um, I'll link in the show notes to the book that I'm reading about Catherine the Great, but like they kind of just like picked up little baby Duke, like in the middle of the night and was like, no, you're not going to be King of Sweden. You're going to be King of Russia. You're coming with us. And he was just like, I don't really want to do that. And they were like, la la la, we can't hear you (laughs) coming to Russia. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I know. Like, I think I go into this like in our a little bit in our Patreon episode that we'll be doing a little later on. But this part of the whole story is like, what the fuck? Right. (laughs) But uh, Nathan, who was the current ruler of Russia? Uh, It was Empress Elizabeth. So there was a bunch before her. And it all happened in a very short amount of time. (laughs) But it was Empress Elizabeth at the time. And I personally, I think Elizabeth was pretty cool yeah she She was a pretty good ruler and this in this episode we're pretty much only going to say positive things about elizabeth she was not a perfect person but this is not an episode on elizabeth so we won't dive into it too much um i'm sure she'll get her own episode one day but yeah but she ends up she ends up having peter swept away to russia and you know starts grooming him to be the next czar of russia right okay 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 Joanna was like, I can make this work. She's like, fuck Sweden. We're past it. Joanna's Joanna had an older brother who died. But when he was alive, he was engaged to Elizabeth, who is now Empress in Russia. And so she starts writing to her just being like, dear sister. Like they hadn't talked in years, but now she's like, dear sister. Hello. It is me, <laughs> Joanna um what (laughs) up let's get together and um long time no see long time no see haven't heard from you and also um we've skipped over a little bit joanna has had several other children she has a son now but she gives birth to a daughter and she's like we have named her elizabeth after you like she's very obviously (laughs) pandering and like not making any 
qualms about it whatsoever. <laughs> she is pretty shameless with like, what I'm getting at is I have a daughter. You've got an heir. Let's let's get them together. But yeah, <laughs> the moment Joanna finds out that the little Duke, her daughter, got along with so well, is now going to be the future czar. She was like, it is on. Yeah, weird side note, there was this time around now that one of her uncles proposed to her. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, her mother's uh, baby uh, brother, (laughs) who was only like eight years older than her, so not that creepy, was just in love with her. Well, no, it is creepy, though. Yeah. Because uncle. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's that's pretty pretty fucking creepy. But I mean, nothing nothing actually happened between the two of them, which thank God. Uh, he would he would like always tell her how pretty she was and like how charming she was, which. Bleh. But I I bet it was nice. She hadn't been told that. I bet it was just nice for somebody. Yeah, she's been told that she's ugly her entire life. So I mean, I she, bet that really you know she probably enjoyed hanging out with him. She probably just <laughs> liked the attention, but she knew. Yeah. She knew very well that her mother was never going to agree to her marrying her nobody brother and that they wanted to get her married to like a king or a czar. And so she was just, she just deflected and she was like, if my parents say yes, I'll marry you. But then enjoyed this little flirtation knowing it's going nowhere. And the only reason I like even wanted to include that little story is because, oh, I just think it's so nice. Somebody's being nice to her. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, for one second. <laughs> okay, but as soon as he's entered the story, we're going to forget about ye old creepy uncle. Yes. Uh, because on New Year's Day, 1744, a letter arrives addressed to Joanna from uh-huh, the King of Prussia. And he's like, hey, I hear your daughter's pretty charming. And from what Empress Elizabeth of Russia has heard, she'd be a great match for my new ward, you know. The baby Duke future czar Peter. Uh, Mm -hmm. Here's 10,000 rubies from the Russian throne. And it gets your daughter dressed and her ass over here so that we can check her out. Uh, And So the the currency in Russia is rubles. But every time I say it out loud, I think it sounds like RuPaul's. Oh. uh, uh, (laughs) So every time that I'm like, they gave him 10,000 rubles. I'm like, 10,000 rubles? Yes! You better <laughs> you work! You better work! <laughs> 10,000 works! 10,000 RuPaul's. You better work. Yes. Uh, so Catherine's dad was actually not into this match. Because, yeah, he was about that Swedish game. Um, yeah. Russia's really far away, and he's going to miss his daughter. And right? Russia's, at this time, Russia's kind of viewed, and kind of is, uh, the wild, wild west. Except it's like, east uh <laughs> yeah because peter the great had just started to reform russia to not be so crappy <laughs> yeah but it still had it still i mean it still had serfs it had some ways to go you know surfs up man surfs so up. The, <laughs> so this is like a dangerous place that to send your daughter basically <laughs> but most importantly he's this staunch lutheran and he knew catherine would have to convert to the strict russian orthodoxy which he was uh seeing as a really big problem that was his biggest problem her dad was not one to speak up so the fact that we have documentation that he spoke up about this and like talked over his overbearing wife to be like i'm not sure about this means it must have been a big deal to him do you know what i mean Mm -hmm. um for sure yeah he knew Catherine was gonna go he knew that if joanna was into it Catherine was gonna go but he like tells her like basically if you get there and it's scary if you get there and you don't like him call me send me a message I'm going to come bring you Aww. home, baby girl. Isn't that sweet? I'm not crying. You're crying. 
<laughs> I mean, but I mean, at least she has support from somebody in her life because mm-hmm. it sounds like she's never had that before. Yeah, but while I'm sure Catherine really appreciated her dad's sweet words, <laughs> she's probably like, nope, 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 nope. I'm getting the hell out of Dodge. I hated living here forever and you know i got ten thousand rupauls Mm -hmm. and those rupauls are gonna sashay away yes (laughs) yes (laughs) except that joanna spent all the rupauls on herself joanna spent all the rupauls Uh, on new clothes for herself because in her mind she was like why do they care what my little like 13 year old daughter is dressed at dressed in why do they care so she bought herself like all these new dresses new jewelry new trunks and didn't spend like a dime on Catherine. Ugh, what no. a bitch i don't like her i know so they arrive into berlin and joanna rushes to meet with the king frederick and leaves Catherine back in their rooms so when she rocks up there he's like okay but like where's your daughter and joanna's shocked and she's like why do you why do you want to see her what do you mean my daughter you don't what what? the child why do you want to see the child (laughs) which could she possibly have she ends up this she ends up lying and saying that she's sick like what the fuck is wrong with this woman (sighs) um the next day she shows up to court again without Catherine, and frederick's like completely lost his patience at this point and is like i don't care if she's sick bring her here now and joanna's like uh but she doesn't have anything to wear <laughs> and he's like i sent you ten thousand rupauls why does she not have anything to wear and he just like loses because his rupaul rupaul <laughs> would have some great clothes right and ten thousand of them Come right on. <laughs> and so he just loses his patience and he's like bring her one of my sister's dresses and his sister's like an adult woman and Catherine's like 14, 13. And so it doesn't fit her, but it, like it's mm-hmm. better than anything she brought. So she's presented to the King of Prussia in a dress that doesn't fit. <laughs> <laughs> so he invites Catherine to sit with him at dinner, which was a real big deal. Mm-hmm. Um, the dinner table at the Prussian court was usually like, the higher you rank, the closer you sat to the king. So sitting next to the king means, bitch, you important. You're really So important. this, yeah, this little no one who's, you know, been treated like shit her entire life by her, her mother gets to sit next to the king of Prussia. That's a big deal for her. Oh, Joanna what? was pissed. Joanna was like, I'm why? Like- well, because Joanna was sat down like at the end of the table with all the other nobody yeah. princesses. And she was like, why is my... It's not about you, Joanna! Like, I get, I just get so frustrated. <laughs> I know, because like to me, it's like her entire life, she's been wanting... I mean, her and Catherine's entire life, she's been trying to make marry her off to this super advantageous marriage. Well, you're getting that. You are getting just that. And part of that is your daughter is going to be held in high esteem. It reminds me of like (laughs) stage moms. You know what I mean? Like stage moms that actually like didn't see, didn't get to have their own fame. And so they're like pushing their children out there. And that's totally what it is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's really all about them. But yeah, so she's, Joanna's pissed that she's not sitting by the king and she's being very vocal about it. So luckily, despite her mom being a pain in the ass, King Frederick just thought Catherine was absolutely delightful. He was just like, everything she said was cute or funny or smart and she had great etiquette and and then basically Joanna's just down there at the end of the table being like, hey, what are y'all talking about? You know, and he's just like trying to. <laughs> he doesn't hold he doesn't hold her annoying mother against her, which I think is beneficial. Yes. So Frederick decides that Catherine would be a great wife for the future czar. So Prussia and Russia at this point in time were on Rhyme. the brink of war. So securing the next Tsarina of Russia to be a Prussian princess 
was a huge diplomatic move. Right. And since the current empress was already familiar with Catherine's family and the young baby Duke had already met and liked Catherine well enough, it seemed like everything was just kind of falling into place. The pieces are all coming together. Yeah. Um, Frederick is like, okay, I think this will work. And he extract, he's like, y'all can go ahead and go on to Russia. But the thing was, remember that message came on New Year's Day. So it's January. I don't, do, do you know that Russia is cold? Yes. That is why I'm wearing my fabulous fuzzy hat. Yes. It, when mm. people traveled from Berlin to Moscow, they tended to do it, you know, not in winter. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine um, Russia's real fucking cold. It's very cold. It's very cold. Um, the road from Berlin into just like greater Russia was usually people would actually take a boat into like it was safer to take a boat into like a really far tip of russia and then take a carriage down or something but they were like no we're in a hurry we're just going to take the road the only other people they saw on the road were mail carriers or people carrying medicine so like frontline workers basically nobody yeah right the the essential workers yes. of uh, this, this 18th century um it was dangerous <laughs> is what we're getting at and the, but yeah. they it was like when destiny calls you gotta go you know yeah and they were on a deadline like they mm -hmm. had to get there by peter's birthday in february so it's time to hustle honey and after over a month on this dangerous roads, they finally arrive in Moscow and they arrived on the morning of Peter's birthday. And they're just like sitting in this waiting room, right. waiting to be officially presented to Empress Elizabeth. Like, um, wonder why they haven't picked me up yet. <laughs> but like, so they're sitting in this waiting room, just looking around. And I have to imagine Catherine has never seen this type of wealth before because empress elizabeth is all about showing how wealthy they are she empress elizabeth is all about jules eleguanza yes dripping in jules eleguanza she's looking fabulous flaunting her wealth yes it reminds me of you remember in the elizabeth of york episode we talk about how her dad was always wanting to one up the French king and make his court a little bit nicer than his. I feel like Catherine's or Elizabeth is just like, um, I need to remind everybody how rich Russia is. So everything here is gold. Everything has diamonds dripping off of it. So we just see baby Catherine sitting in like this waiting room, waiting to meet this great empress and just being like, I feel incredibly poor right now. <laughs> yeah, because she grew up with the Prussians that didn't really have any money and their princes and exactly. you know, didn't have any fucking yeah. money. So here she is in this foreign land. And, and not to mention, like, Russian architecture is impressive. If you haven't ever seen it. Yes. You know, it's very impressive. So I'm sure she was just like, uh, okay. <laughs> right? So while they're waiting to be, like, officially presented... Um, Peter burst in unannounced and he just like breaks protocol and he just like walks in with his arms open and he's just like, I couldn't wait any longer to see you guys. He rushes over, greets them with hugs. Today is his 16th birthday. He's in a great mood. They met each other five years ago. And really what it comes down to, I think, is that um, Peter never really took to Russian culture. He never really took to the language. He never really took to the religion. So he was so happy to see another German speaking person, to see another Prussian princess. You know, he was just like, people that know me. Oh my God, thank God you're here. Yeah, and I think we'll talk a little bit more about his character later, but because it's a little questionable mm. um but he just has refused to learn russian or adopt their religion so that's not really rubbing the russians the right way no um because he's like it he's like christina aguilera a genie in a bottle gotta rub him the right way <laughs> um 
I am Peter in a bottle. You gotta rub me the right way. <laughs> um, so he's he's been super homesick and doesn't really care for this new job or the being the czar of all these crazy Russians. Mm -hmm. And he remembers liking Catherine. So, you know, he's excited to have a friend. Yeah. So Catherine's like really excited. This is a really good start. And they're meeting, you know, your future husband. So everything seems like it's going well. Right. So how would we describe Peter now that it's five years later and he's not the 11 year old alcoholic that we met earlier? Um, he's still a little unusual. He's 16 mm -hmm. and he hasn't hit puberty. That's not unheard uh, of. So but, yeah. But also, if we're like depending on having somebody that can continue the Romanoff line, it's also not a great start. Yeah. But as a result for not hitting puberty yet at 16, he's just really immature for his age. And Catherine yeah is quite mature for her age not. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh so on that first night he tells Catherine, i'm actually in love with another girl um she's the daughter of one of elizabeth's ladies in waiting but elizabeth won't let me marry her and had her sent away from court <laughs> yeah i don't really i really don't think he told her that to like hurt her feelings yeah he's just immature and insensitive what, like that's the best that i can what i think it to. is is that he he doesn't have anybody else at court that's his age and he doesn't have anybody else at court that speaks the language he wants to speak in um because everyone in russian court speaks french and maybe he's never bothered to learn that either and so maybe he's just I don't know. Like, do you ever just like overshare with a friend and don't like, maybe that's just what it was, you know? But, um, Catherine would later be like, she was like, it didn't hurt my feelings. It just made me realize I'm not working with the most intelligent guy here. He's not, he's right. never the smartest guy in the room. <laughs> <laughs> so they are finally presented to Elizabeth, who is this intimidating and bold figure. Um, she's a really big personality and a bit overbearing. I mean, she's Peter the Great's first and oldest daughter. Right. Um, but from the first moment they meet, she just absolutely adores Catherine. Dotes on her, mm -hmm. gives her gifts, gives her RuPaul's. Mm -hmm. So things are going really good for her. <laughs> the moment that Catherine gets her own RuPaul's, she sends them back to her dad for her brothers and sisters' tutors because she knew that they were cash strapped. Isn't that nice? Even though her family was kind of dicky to her, she's so good she's to still, them. She's still like, I know y'all need this and I don't really need it. I don't know. I feel like I'm kind of set here. I could just like pawn off one of these uh, chandeliers and be set for life. Yeah, right. But I mean, I think the, the reason the Empress treated her so well is because the Empress didn't have children herself. And she wanted them so badly. Yeah, and she had tried to treat Peter like her own son. But he really rejected his effect, her affections. I think he had some mommy issues, maybe. <laughs> but now, like, but for Catherine, Catherine's now getting all of the praise that she didn't get from her own mother. So Catherine's just happy to have someone who's affectionate towards her. Right. So know? Catherine and Elizabeth hit it off because Elizabeth is looking for somebody to be motherly to. And Catherine just wants somebody to love her. So it. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Catherine is given rooms and a few ladies in waiting, like most royalty is. And of course, her fucking stage mom, Joanna, complains about Catherine's rooms being nicer than hers. <sighs> They're supposed to be. This fucking she's chick. the future Tsarina. Yes. I like, know. What? She's, she's, not... she's like, why does she have her own rooms and I have to bunk with a lady in waiting. It's like, because you're not, Oh my God. It's not about you, Joanna. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Empress Elizabeth's court is like over the fucking top. Oh my gosh. There were, there's, they're bringing it to you every ball. There's ballrooms every night. Mm -hmm. Ladies to change their dresses three times a day. Three times a I day. Mean, you had to, 
Yes, yes. And you had to be on all the time. You needed to know your etiquette. You need to know the dances. You have to be dressed for the right occasion. It could be a little overwhelming for even the most seasoned socialite, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. It didn't stress Catherine out. She, if if she was stressed out, she never showed it. It seemed like she just was, I mean, she'd been trained for this her whole life, you know? Yeah, and Catherine is so far pretty popular at court. And, I mean, Empress likes her, so it's like, okay, time for you to get that traditional Russian education. Mm-hmm. So they hire a couple of different tutors to help her learn the language, you know, the religion, the history of Russia, and... We know our girl Catherine loves to learn, so this is really her fucking This jam. is her jam. And she leans in hard. Yeah. Yeah, she leans in hard. I mean, remember, she loves learning languages, especially, and Russian is just so different than what every other language she studied, so she's, like, honestly excited. Which the challenge. She didn't like, have to be enthusiastic. Yeah, she, she didn't have to be, you know? Right. She already knew French. And French was spoke at all the courts, so she really didn't even have to put in the effort to speak Russian. But she did. But she loved it. Um, She was so obsessed with learning the language. I've had this before. Sometimes you can't sleep because you've started a new project, so you're just like, fuck it, I'm going to get up and like, I'm just not going to sleep and I'm just going to work on that project instead. So she did that. So she'd get up in the middle of the night and be like, fuck it, I'm going to study my Russian. But... She wouldn't light a fire. She wouldn't put on enough clothes. It's winter in Russia. She catches a cold from getting up in the middle of the night to study Russian. Um, That cold turns into pneumonia, which in the 18th century, I mean, that's easily a death sentence, you know? I mean, even today, it's still a death sentence for people. Yeah. Yeah. rumors rumors immediately start spreading around court like like this little prussian princess is sick she might die how did she get sick she stayed up too late studying russian what? <laughs> studying russian <laughs> everyone is impressed everyone is like oh my god she is like bringing herself to death's door just to make sure that she understands our culture what the okay you know that game of telephone you would play when you were a kid where you like you whisper something and like the story gets bigger and bigger and bigger? I feel like that's yeah. like it started with, yeah, she got sick because she stayed up all night studying Russian and it just spread to like, she is so dedicated to Russia. Oh my God. Like it just, the rumors got bigger. She took a knife to the throat and she almost got killed and she survived. Be- because she loves Mother world. Russia. Like, yes. Like the stories <laughs> just grew and grew and grew that like the whole court is like okay she might be the baddest bitch out of all of us you know (laughs) but uh, but even nearly on her deathbed Catherine is smart she pretends to be sleeping so her ladies in waiting feel comfortable to talk freely about her or about her and other gossip Mm -hmm. so she's like making all these little mental notes of you know who's important at court who are they mentioning? Exactly. Who's, you know, what what's going on while she's sick? You know, she's using them as a way to keep tabs. Well, on exactly like on she court. did in Prussia. She's just making mental notes of it's the exact same thing. You know, she's just like, oh, OK, mm-hmm. I'm going to listen to them. Tell me about whatever count or whatever so I can hopefully live and use this information later. And just like the mother that she always wanted, um, Empress Elizabeth, like, visits her daily, holds her in her arms, prays for her, gives her gifts. Like, this is the exact opposite of how she was Oh, my gosh. And this is the exact opposite. Like, yeah, Empress Elizabeth's showing up every day, like, holding her, cuddling with her, like, praying with her. And her own mother, if uh, Catherine, like rolled over and like felt a pain and went ugh, and like moaned her mom would be like shut up stop what where do you quit moaning and so like the juxtapose of like how her own mother treated her 
and how Elizabeth treated her in this time. Who do you think she's going to have loyalties to? Right. Right. Empress Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. Um, And then when it's looking really grim, they're like, we should really call for the pastor to maybe come pray for her soul Mm -hmm. because she might die. And her mother goes to send for a Lutheran priest. And Catherine sits up in bed and is like, (laughs) oh, no, honey, Mm -mm. send for my Russian Orthodox priests. We're not doing that Lutheran shit. Mm -mm. And. Let me tell you, when the people of Moscow heard about this request, they were like, oh my God, on her deathbed, she called for Russian Orthodoxy. Are you kidding me? Are you serious? Yes! <laughs> like they were, they were like football fans in the stand being like, she did it! Like they, the entire- They scored points. They did the points good. Yes. They were, the people of Russia, not even the court, not even the royal court, but the entire metropolitan of Russia was all talking about this little Prussian princess who has showed up and is on her deathbed so dedicated to Russia that she wants an orthodoxy priest. She became a celebrity. Like she... So she recovers because obviously this is a three part episode. Uh, so you died, know, like, so that, 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 what if, over. What if it was like, okay, and she died, and that was the end. Da, 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 da. Ah. So she, she recovers, and obviously everyone at court at this point is just so relieved because she's become this like beloved figure, this person that's just sacrificed so much for Russia. And it's worth noting that the court had also heard that Joanna had been such a dick to her during her sickness. Mm -hmm. So when Catherine came back to court, she showered her with affection and praise and money. And Joanna totes got the cold shoulder. (laughs) I I mean, do you blame the people of Moscow? If you, I mean, do you blame anybody? No, she was a bitch to her daughter on her deathbed. Like, yeah, and now all of these these Russian people in Moscow are just very protective of Catherine. Mm-hmm. It's like their own child. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not thinking of her as like this foreigner. You know, she's a Russian princess. And the, it's interesting because they don't necessarily think of Peter that way. So they're like, this mm-hmm. is, again, some foreshadowing for episode two and three. <laughs> That they're not really thinking of Peter as one of them, but they are very much thinking of Catherine as one of them. So it's time for her to formally change religions now, which Catherine did in like a conversion um, ceremony in June of 1744. And Catherine knew her dad was really worried about this. So she writes a letter home and she's like, dad, it's not that different. They're both Christian religions. Yeah. But still, it's it's the same God and it's the same Jesus. Dad, it's fine. It's not that different. It's not Chill a big deal. Ow. <laughs> the thing is, I think it was honestly because Catherine was really never a real mm-hmm. religious person. Mm-hmm. I mean, so I don't think it was that hard for her to make a switch. But I mean, she, of course, like recognized all the holidays, attended church her whole life when she was expected to. She would know all the rules, but it, it just wasn't something that she was. She wasn't into. a pious person. We talk a lot about our queens. Catherine the, of Aragon. Catherine uh, of Aragon. Isabella Castile. Yeah. So many of our queens, we talk about them being very pious. It just, it never touched her heart. And I kind of feel like that doesn't, I mean, who cares? She still represented her people as well as she could. She just kind of didn't care what God she prayed to, which is fine. And guess, guess who fucking hated that? Her bitch ass mom. Yes. Her mom was like, um, <laughs> The day before her conversion, she slept like a baby, as if it was a bad thing. Like it was like, so I'm glad she I'm glad she took some Lunesta and got a good night's sleep. Who the fuck cares? (laughs) And she didn't like drive in her sleep or eat in her sleep or whatever. Oh my god. The only thing I've ever done on Lunesta is buy a Snuggie that I didn't remember buying, but it was a great purchase. I (laughs) love my Snuggie. 
any way. <laughs> so the, the, the day the day after that she officially converted to orthodoxy was a BFD. Mm-hmm. And they had this BFD ceremony. And Catherine had to fast for three days. I can't. Three days. I cannot. Three days. Three days with no food. And she's expected to be on top of her game at like a ceremony where she's going to wear like a big dress covered in like diamonds. I am bitchy if I don't have breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> and she was like, a perfect princess. No. I, I, I wonder if she was thinking snacks. Because again, she's not pious. Uh, she's sneaking not in, snacks. She's not sneaking into religion. Snacks. I wonder if she was sneaking snacks and just like not telling anybody. Because I would be. They, they'd be like, do you convert? And I'd be like, do you convert? <laughs> <laughs> so, fun fact. This is when her name formally changed over to Catherine. She actually asked like, uh, can I just keep my original name Sophia you know it's Mm -hmm. a pretty common name in Russia and you know it's not that far out there Mm -hmm. and she was actually told no yeah so do you remember I guess it was about a year ago we did a podcast on Sophia Alexandria she was Mm -hmm. um the half sister of Peter the Great but Peter the Great was like a little baby and she like did a coup and took over the Russian government. Do you remember that episode, Nathan? Yes. Yeah, I do. Yeah, so did Elizabeth. And um, <laughs> the name Sophia had not been used in the royal Russian family since. So it was very much of like, um, a no, 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 no. That cannot be your name. <laughs> and so she was like, what? She was like, uh, okay, then what name do you want me to take? And Elizabeth's mother was named Catherine. And she was like, I'd like you to be Catherine. And she was like, okay, fine. I have no attachment to Sophia. That's fine. I'm Catherine now. (laughs) I love how like, I love how she's just like cool with everything. She's like, "Uh, okay, whatever. I don't care. (laughs) She's just like, is it going to make me very powerful and get me out of the clutches of my mother? Fine. Yeah, sure. I mean, I don't know about you. I might be a little biased. I think Catherine is a very pretty name. I think it sounds like a a hooker's name. Hey! (laughs) So, anyway, it's time to start planning this wedding. So, up until this point, Russia royal weddings weren't really a public event. Mm -mm. But Elizabeth was about any excuse that she could have to show her wealth, her opulence, her RuPaul. So like, it was good. Her RuPaul. <laughs> so this was going to be like this over the drop betrothal ceremony. Mm-hmm. Um, it lasted four hours. A betrothal four ceremony. Hours. It's not even the wedding. It's just the precursor to the wedding. Four hours. <laughs> <laughs> but Catherine, of course, curtsied, played her part perfectly, did everything wonderful. Except that at the banquet, Joanna threw a fit that she was sat at a table with the ladies in waiting to her daughter and not at the table with Elizabeth and Peter and Catherine. This woman is a stage mother. Joanna, <laughs> Johanna, what you doing? So Elizabeth was just like at her wits end with Catherine's mom she hears joanna being like why do i why am i sat with the ladies in waiting i should be at a special table and so elizabeth is like all right you want a special table and this is where she is so fucking petty she's like oh you want a special table um oh it doesn't look like there's a special table in here for you let me set you up your own special table she has her staff set her up her own table like in two buildings over (laughs) oh i am living for empress i know and so (laughs) joanna has to go sit at her special table that has been specially set up for her and specially like they've served her her food and everything (laughs) like in two buildings over and it just put her (laughs) in her fucking place and i am here for it 
Yeah, and Elizabeth is also like, yeah, once these kids are married, <laughs> you're going home. Um, bye. You gotta go. You're too much. Bye, 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 bye. So, sadly, uh, things go bye, bye, bye uh, after this. <laughs> so, Peter gets smallpox and a new slash. Smallpox is no fucking joke, y'all. I didn't want to, but I did, like, a Google search of, like, people who have survived smallpox and, like, what their faces look like afterwards to understand this better. It's bad. It's not cute. It's not, it's not a cute look. It's, yeah, my heart goes out to anybody who gets that disease and has to i guess in america now that we have vaccines because vac you don't really get that anymore but it would really damage your whole body for the rest of your life yeah and i, and I think at this point Catherine's thinking you know what happens if he dies right you know it, it, he, what happens if he recovers you know does she have to go back with her mother I mean, that's like hell. Well, like, but also, you like, know? she's officially changed religions. If she gets sent back to Prussia, is she going to be ostracized for changing religion? Mm, religions? Good point. Does she stay in Russia and hope someone else wants to marry her? I can imagine while he's on his sick bed, she's having um, some crisis of confidence. You know what I mean? Oh, for sure. But thankfully, I mean, not really thankfully. I mean, Peter gets better, <laughs> but it's not good um <laughs> no and then the story gets sad um, he, he is obviously forever changed because with anything that leaves you debilitated physically and like scarred forever obviously will take an emotional yeah. toll so he's forever changed and he had before this always been nice to Catherine. Something just fucked him up so bad that he, well, it's probably because his face was fucked up so bad that he wanted to make the rest of the world feel as bad as he did. Do you know what I mean? Ugh. I know. Yeah. So, I mean, he's just fucked up though. I've never been particularly sensitive to other people's feelings before this, but after this, he just becomes. It's just a whole different level of mean, you know? Cruel, like cruel. Like he's being, he's not just mean, he's cruel. Right. Um, I mean, it's just. It's trauma. It's kind of to deflect. Yeah, his trauma. Exactly. Yeah. You know, this trauma of like nearly dying will do a number on you mentally. And, you know, he's regressed back to being a child, you know? He'd never fully, like, hit puberty yet, like we had talked about earlier. So after him having this trauma of nearly dying, apparently it's kind of common to, like, regress, like, mentally. And so he got, like, when he was a very little bitty kid, he was obsessed with um, playing soldier, doing fake military drills with his friends. And because he's regressed, he just goes back to like that comfort of remembering that fun, those fun games him and his friends would play. He just gets so obsessed with like, let's play military all the time. Yeah. So when Peter is brought back to court, Catherine is brought in to see him and he looks horrible and he honestly knows it. Mm -hmm. So he approached Catherine and goes, do you recognize me, Catherine? And Catherine made the biggest mistake of her 15 years in life. She was such a smart girl, but she was so dumb in this one interaction. Yeah, what she should have done is like compose herself and lie to his face and be like, you look great. You look you look awesome. You look the same to me. Anything nice she could have said would have done better than what she did. <laughs> what she did instead was she saw him. Y'all, like, I mean, his face was completely full of scars and it was bloated, like, two times its size. He'd lost all his hair, so they gave him some, like, weird wig. He had, he had, he had never been particularly handsome to begin with, but now he just looked like she was not ready for it. And so what she did is she got, she just, she couldn't control her face. And she made a face like she was horrified. And she just goes, I'm glad you're back. And then immediately 
not walked to her room, ran, like ran away from him and then got to her room oh and passed God. out. It was the worst thing she could have done. Like, I actually, I actually feel really bad for Peter in that moment. Like, had they ever been a love story? No. But had they been friends up to this point? Yeah. If she would have just offered him a nice word, maybe things would have been very different. Yeah. And this is the moment that really changed the path of her life. You know, while they never were in love, they could have had a tolerable, pleasant enough Mm -hmm. arranged marriage. We've seen that before Mm -hmm. in some of the women we've covered, but not now, you know, from this moment on, Peter hates her and was hell bent on making her life hell. In fact, I read one story that they were like, they were at a ball because that's what Empress Elizabeth (laughs) did every night. And they were dancing and they're just dancing, having like a pleasant enough dance. And he's just like, you know what I read in the law, law books recently? It's like, um, once you're my wife, I can beat you. And so long as I don't kill you, I can beat you all you all I want. And she was just like, cool story, bro. And it's it's absolutely (laughs) factual. So long as you didn't kill your wife, you could beat her all you want because bag of dicks. Bag of dicks. Oh my God. History is bag of dicks. History is. (laughs) So she's just like, okay, thanks for sharing that information with me. (laughs) Like, right. It's awkward. So their wedding plans continued, though everyone noticed at this point how Peter's changed and how much he really despises his fiance now <laughs> elizabeth even went to Catherine and was like okay do you really want to go through with this and Catherine's like yeah i'm gonna be the czarina of russia and i'm not going back to my stage mom are you serious and elizabeth was just totally relieved like she assumed that peter would get over this whatever was happening and just you know that made him hate his bride so much and everything would be okay Mm -hmm. again. Well, she thought once they're in bed together, he'd be like, Hey, that, that vagina will heal everything. Well, I mean, she's a cute little, like once they were in bed together, he'd be like, okay, this ain't so bad. Say, show me them titties. Show me them titties, girl. (laughs) What's up? Um, (laughs) Elizabeth is, Elizabeth's advisors were concerned, though, because, like you said, she, he's just not showing any interest. His, uh, like, development was delayed, and he's still not showing any interest in women. And they were like, we really think you should push back this marriage until he gets a little bit older, until, like, some things start functioning. And Elizabeth was just like, nope. He's just going to figure it out. Let's go. And um, also, no one told Catherine what to do in the bedroom either. This gives me oh, angry no. Bridgerton vibes. I know we've both... You watch Bridgerton, right? <laughs> yes. Like, I, she yes, tries to ask her mom, like, what happens between husband and wife. And she's just like, oh, the farm animals figure it out. You'll figure it out. No! Tell your daughter <laughs> what happens in the bedroom because it's going to be real shocking when a guy comes at her with a and so she asked her mom what happens in the bedroom and her mom slaps her and she's like how could you be so inappropriate and she's just like okay I got. oh my gosh that's so she's so annoying i know so the wedding takes place on august 21st of 21st 21st um, I had a lift there. <laughs> I'm partial to a lift. Uh, the wedding took place on August 21st, uh, 1745. And Catherine was, you know, loving her sweet 16. Yeah. She's She wore a silver gown, dripping in jewels, a la yes. Guanza, pounds of crystal. It makes me think of... Do you remember when we talked about Alexandra, the last Tsarina <laughs> of Russia? Like, the one that was the last one do you- <laughs> the one the one whose last name is really hard to say um 
do you remember us talking about even then in like the 1800s her being like these jewels are too much for me to carry and she was a grown-ass woman this is a 15 year old girl asking to carry a dress that weighs like 20 pounds a crown that weighs like 10 pounds jewels that weigh like another 10 pounds and she's just like oh like it was too much for her (laughs) <laughs> little body she had a 17 inch waist on her wedding day oh my lord that is teeny tiny she, she, everything she was wearing probably weighed more than she weighed it was a workout her <laughs> wedding day was a workout for her <laughs> <laughs> heavy as the crown <laughs> oh yeah that gives a whole different Literally. Yes, exactly. It gives a whole different. Yeah, literally. But you can imagine that she was so uncomfortable. Oh but she didn't show. No. She didn't uh-uh. show it on her face. So that's good. <laughs> and um, she actually asked Elizabeth, like, can I please take this crown off at least? I have a migraine. And Elizabeth was like, no, it's fine. This isn't going to last long. Because an hour into the reception, Elizabeth just very abruptly called it off. Which made everybody go, what? I thought we were here to party all night. And she's like, no, y'all can all go home. (laughs) We are putting husband and wife to bed. Time to go to Bone Town. Right. (laughs) So the couple was walked to their bedroom. And so they were walked to one bedroom, but Peter was taken to a separate room, presumably to like undress and come right back. And Catherine was taken to her room and she was undressed. She was put in a beautiful pink silk nightgown. And from the description, I would love that nightgown as well. It sounds very pretty. <laughs> and you have to shake your, mm. your boobies like this. It's making me feel pretty. Victoria's Secret would be jealous. Oh, girl. Um, she begged one of her ladies in waiting. She was like, will you stay with me until Peter comes? I don't know what to do. I don't know what to expect. And that lady in waiting that she was talking to was married already. And she was like, please just stay with me and like, tell me what to expect. Tell me what to do. And that, that lady in waiting was like, I, I can't, I'll get in trouble. I have to go. So no one would stay with her, which sounds very scary. If you don't know what happens on a wedding night. So Catherine's like left in her room in this sexy little nightgown and this sexy little night to have a sexy little time. And for hours and hours, she waits sexily, uh, but she's nervous out of her fucking mind and she has no idea what to expect. And then finally, Peter arrives drunk as fuck. One o'clock in the morning. Drunk as hell. Passing out on the bed and... No touching her whatsoever. Just done. And Catherine didn't know what to expect, but she had a feeling this was wrong. Like, it's so fucked up that people don't tell their children. But like, she was like, I don't think that was supposed to happen. So the two of them would go to bed without touching each other. And in Catherine's memoir, she wrote, and that's how it went for the next nine years. And oh that, my lord, that's where we'll leave you. Yay! The story was like kind of happy, sad, happy. It's um, but it's probably gonna get real nasty after this. Empress Catherine, if you're nasty. <laughs> All right, so that's where this episode ends. Nathan, cheers! Cheers, bitches, to part one of a hell of a woman. Ha- oh my god! All right. Check in in a couple of weeks to hear the rest of the story. Cheers, bitches. Thanks for listening. Mwah. Mwah.